Thank you guys all for being here. Welcome. Can we give these amazing panelists another round of applause? <laughs> so we are so excited to have you guys here today. Um, I want to start by letting you introduce yourselves, uh, tell the students here a little bit about what it is that you do, um, your background, and we'll start with Tracy. All right. Hi. Good morning, everybody. My name is Tracy Kahn. I work at NASA Ames Research Center, which is really close to here, just a little bit down the highway. Um, I work in, it's called the Mission Design Division at Ames, and we work on designing missions and designing very small satellites. Um, for science uh, exploration missions. And I brought a few examples that hopefully I can show y'all if you can stop by later at the table back there. Um, I just recently moved to this area. I started at Ames in January. Before that, I was in grad school. And before that, I used to work at Johnson Space Center in Houston for a while supporting the International Space Station. So if you want to talk about anything having to do with space, I can talk your ear off all day. So looking forward to getting to know y'all uh, and chatting more later. <laughs> All right, so good morning. morning. How's everybody feeling today? Good? Yeah. You ready to learn a lot of stuff? Yeah. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> that's good, that's good. This is the whole idea, right? So my name is Oscar Fernandez. I work for Genentech. How many of you heard of Genentech before? Oh, two, uh, three. All right, I'll just tell you. <laughs> so Genentech is a biotechnology company, and we develop uh, drugs, and we also do DNA research and cancer research. I happen to be working on the technology department and we do software deployments. So later on in the breakout rooms, I could tell you a little bit more. So I'm on the IT side of the, of the company. Uh, we are located in South San Francisco. Uh, we have 20,000 employees at that location. It's a huge campus. Uh, it has, you know, laundry facilities, gym, <coughs> you know, a lot of stuff. And also, um, it's a great company to be in. I love working there. Fantastic people there. Um, my background is professional background. I have an MBA from Georgetown University in global management and global deployments. I have worked for Apple, for IBM, uh, and for other tech companies, smaller and bigger companies. So, so far, uh, Genentech has been an amazing uh, opportunity for me. So I hope to share that, those things with you, those experiences, and hopefully you can learn something from it. That's it. Hey everyone, my name is Sargon. I work on Google Photos. Um, so that's the app that you can store all your photos for free forever and it doesn't take up space on your phone. So it's like kind of changed my life, hopefully changed yours. We'll learn more about it. Um, and I also brought VR devices, so virtual re uh, reality devices um, where you'll be able to see some of the uh, panoramic photos and VR photos um, in a daydream device. So it'll be pretty cool. A little bit about myself, I grew up in the Bay. I went to, um, I live in Fremont. Um, I went to school at Cal, graduated, and then ended up in the Bay again. Um, I work um, at Google, just like across the street. It's like a five minute walk. Um, and I started working at Google immediately after college. Never thought I would, but somehow ended up there. So we can talk more about that. Uh, yeah, I really enjoy working um, at Google Photos. Um, at Google in general, I've had two different teams I worked on, um, and I've really enjoyed both of them. I worked on Maps before Google Photos. Um, it's a lot of fun. I usually wake up around like 9, 9.30, stroll into work. Um, so this is a little early to, for me today. Uh, but we can talk more about the details about my day to day. Um, mostly, I spend a lot of time coding um, and developing new features. Um, recently, I just got to go to Indonesia and um, listen and talk to individuals in Indonesia who are using the features I built and see what we can build in the future for them. So there's a lot going on, um, and hopefully I'll get to share it with you. Um, hi, my name is Anupam, and I didn't realize you grew up here. I also grew up like 10 minutes from here. I uh, also went to Cal. Oh, <laughs> and then we, But I... Um, I did my PhD uh, in a different field in university, at University of Michigan, so I did mechanical engineering. And um, I think for me, I just really loved building things. And I think with our design activity, probably the thing most people start with are Legos. And I think um, just as kids, it's just a lot of fun to kind of create things and imagine what you can make. And so we have, we have a Lego activity for you guys this afternoon. 
um, that still relates to the work we're doing, which um, on that level, uh, I actually have experience as an entrepreneur. So right after grad school, I started a company. Um, the company was focused on building devices, new kinds of devices to help people with disability. And um, I think, you know, in the future, you know, we're in a place, this museum's all about technology. I think we're just seeing more and more technology available. And I think in the future, we're really gonna really kind of rethink what it means to be disabled because there'll be so much available to help people, almost to make people the same as if they didn't have any kind of problem. Um, so we're really part of that effort. Uh, after about three years as, as, as a startup, we were acquired by Google, so we also work there, but we're in a different division. Um, it's called Verily, so that Verily is the Google's biomedical initiative. And so um, there's about 400 people in Verily. We have, we're both down here in Mountain View as well as in South San Francisco. And um, anyway, happy to meet you and looking forward to working together this afternoon. Great, thank you all. And I'm excited to get to hear more about your, your backgrounds and your experiences, but since we are um, we're a history museum. We, the students got to explore some of the, the history of computing downstairs a little bit. And as I mentioned before, we all sort of experience that a little bit and that the computers that we use change very quickly. So I would love for you guys all to share your, the first computer you remember using and what stands out about it. What do you remember looking back now about the first experience you had using a computer? Who should go? You can, you can go in whatever I could, order the... I could start, because I looked up your question this morning. Because <laughs> I actually had to look up what the computer was called. Um, I just remember my parents, so my, both my parents worked in Silicon Valley, and they, they were building computer chips. So um, also downstairs, you may see some of these early wafers and early uh, designs of computer memory. Um, so anyway, I remember when I was a kid, they brought this like huge, it was like probably this big briefcase and it was a portable computer and it had a handle on it, but as a kid, I couldn't even pick it up. And um, we put it on the, the table and there was a green screen, it was just green and black, it was a monitor. And I think it was, so it was called an IBM 5051, I think it was the first PC. And um, there was a flight simulator game that I played, which was just like a line and some dials and stuff. And that's all I did. <laughs> uh, I was trying to look it up. I can't even remember. Um, and I hadn't had a chance to ask my parents. But uh, you may remember like the big computers. You might, like we had them in our labs at, at school, too. It was like that big, gray, huge machine. Um, it was actually put in my room like when I was like in sixth grade because I needed to do homework on it. And then eventually we like really wanted to keep it around. We moved it to the garage and then suddenly it went away. Um, but it was like one of those huge devices, um, made a lot of noise. Uh, my dad was also an engineer, so he'd like always try to be like tinkering with it, but it would always just end up making more noise. Uh, he'd like try to put fans in and so forth. Like there was like really bulky stuff in there. Um, but that being said, I remember getting my first email and it was like a SkyMail account or something when I was in fifth grade and I was only able to like use my email like with parents' permission and like they knew the password and like they'd go in and I'd get to send one email. Um, how times have changed. Um, but I thought I'd share that. That's true. No, I, I, could, I could feel you guys. Um, my first computer, the monitor by itself was this yeah. wide. <laughs> I remember a monitor, you guys see, they are very small now. But this thing, I had to get a whole desk to put the, yeah. the monitor there. And, you know, and the screen wasn't that big. The screen was, it was more the plastic in the back and everything else. And I remember trying to connect to, to the internet and everything. You have to wait and just brrr, brrr. You hear the sound, the sound from AOL, if some of you remember AOL. Mm -hmm. uh, you, have to, you have to wait that until the, the internet connected. But that thing was so big. The keyboard, you know, was just a solid, you know, piece there. The mouse was a huge thing. So you have all these pieces, and the computer itself was a tower, right? It was about this tall and this big, and that hasn't changed much, I think. But I think the monitors changed a lot. Mm -hmm. But it was so heavy to carry that thing. It was, but it was a good learning experience, at least to use it and everything. So mm -hmm. we enjoyed it. So hopefully you guys don't have to deal with that anymore. You guys have flat screens now, so it's perfect. Right. In your pocket. Yeah, in your pocket. <laughs> yeah. We had one computer. I have two brothers and a sister. 
and our family shared one computer that was in the living room, and everyone wanted to use it at the same time, and it was a dial-up connection, so you couldn't be on the phone, and it was AOL, you guys. It was the place to be. And so chat rooms and wanting to get on and talk to your friends, that was just the coolest thing. Um, but it, there were a lot of fights between me and my brothers and sisters um, over who gets to use it and when and for how long, and um, fortunately, that's not really an issue anymore, so yeah, Good. yeah. Right. Yeah, we actually have one of those uh, portable briefcase computers in the gallery. So if you guys get a chance, you can check it out. How what a portable computer was like? It's about twenty five pounds. It's, it would be yeah. hard to carry around with you all the time. I think it didn't, <laughs> also didn't have a hard drive. It was a floppy disk with. Yeah. I mean, it was like less than one megabyte was what you could use total. Yeah. <laughs> I used to collect the different color floppy disks because I just thought they were really colorful and I would like color code them. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, so good to now. I'm going to share with you guys a, a fun story. I used to, um, I was invited to a radio show every Saturday for the Latino market, and and uh, people used to call in, and it was a technology show, and this lady calls in, and then she she was you know people were asked, they will ask questions about computers, so she said, oh the, the coffee holder is not working, <laughs> and I'm like the coffee holder, he said yeah you have the little thing you press and the thing that comes out. He said, no, 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 that's for the CD. She thought it was a coffee holder. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that was funny. That was a funny story. <laughs> Probably didn't work for long. <laughs> so I'm sure that for some of you, you know, the flight summary games or other things that you did with your computers at, at growing up and, and home and your experience helped um, you guys think about what you wanted to do. But I'm curious to know um, if you always knew that you wanted to enter a STEM field, if, you, if this is something that you, know, you always saw yourself doing in, in the career path you're in now, or what inspired you to sort of go in the direction that you, that you did in your careers? I'll start. Um, no, definitely did not always know. Um, like I said, I have two brothers and a sister. N none of them went to college. My parents didn't go to college. I didn't know how to, I didn't know what engineering was when I started college, really. Um, but I loved math. I just always loved math a lot. And so when I got to college, learned a little bit more, learned about what engineering majors were and what the job opportunities were, and it sounded really cool. And, you know, you don't know what you don't know, you know? So if you haven't seen, if you don't have people in your family or you don't happen to personally know people in these different fields, you don't vision yourself doing that professionally. So it was a bit of a winding road, but it worked out amazingly. I'm at NASA, living the dream. So, um, <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be a straight path for everyone, but, yeah. That's true, I agree with you completely. It doesn't have to be a straight path, and sometimes we pick a direction, a career, but it may not work out well after a few years, and, and that happened to me. I was in business and in marketing, and at the time, the industry was dying because everything was turning digital, you know, media, social media you know, everything. So my, my industry was kind of dying, so I needed to renew my skills. And I was being left behind, you know. And, and I remember a friend of mine who worked at Genentech, coincidentally, he said, look, I'm, I'm looking for a business analyst. Uh, do you know anything about it? I said, no, but I will learn it. You know, I, let me apply for the job. So I literally took a book, a uh, technology business analyst book, and I read it from cover to cover, and I applied for the job, and I got it. And I'm like, now what? What am I going to do now? So I learned it on the, on the job, and, and I think it was the best decision ever to take a chance, to take that risk, to explore new things. And all of a sudden, you know, I've been in technology for the last 10 years, and it was the best decision ever. So uh, I went from a marketing person to a, to a software deployment person. Um, so the point of the story is for you guys to explore and to really take chances with your, with your different paths, because you're very young still, there's so much time for you to decide what you want to do. And if you have desires, just go for it. And if you don't like it, then you switch. But at least you know. So you never know where you want to end up, you know? I mean, like, there is a CEO, uh, there is a psychologist, and she manages a business company. You know, she has her degrees in psychology. <laughs> go figure, right? So it's kind of interesting. Yeah, I definitely did not know. I won't I wanted to be an engineer. I actually knew I didn't want to be an engineer. Like that was pretty set when I entered college. Um, my dad was an engineer. He had the most boring job, in my opinion. He'd go into work and like 
sit in front of a screen and it was like really like old school and he'd come home and I'd sit in front of another screen and type weird things into a black terminal and I just it was like a lack of communication also as to like what are you doing um, and I like visited a couple times and I was just like not having it so I was like oh well, that's nice like I know one thing I'm not going to be um, I did like math in school, um, but I was also into journalism. I was like the editor of my school paper. I really like arts. Um, so I was like, okay, maybe you can do journalism or like something related to that. Um, I also really loved water and like swimming and marine life. I did an internship in high school in like marine biology. I was like, I'm going to be a marine biologist. So go into college at Cal as an environmental science major, like thinking I'll save the environment, get to have fun. Um, realized I hated biology, um, took every chemistry, physics, biology class the first two years, took no engineering classes, no coding classes, um, and then was still really confused. Uh, junior year, first semester, my counselor was like, we're going to kick you out of school if you don't declare a major. I was like, oh, that's fun. Um, <laughs> And so I ended up taking one CS class to like fill up units, and I was like, oh, this is pretty decent. I guess I can do it. Um, but I kept telling myself, if I do computer science, I can still do anything I wanted afterwards. Because one of the thing great things about computer science, especially now, is it's utilized everywhere. Like um, Oscar said, like you can have a psychology major, but you can integrate it with computer science. Anything you do, um, from journalism to art to building things, like requires software nowadays. So I was like, I can still do anything I want. I can still do anything I want. I don't have to like become my dad. Um, and then somehow, like I ended up becoming a software engineer, and Google was nothing like my parent, my dad's company. It was a lot more fun, uh, a lot more interactive and collaborative in an open environment. And then here we are. Great. <laughs> um, I think I probably had a similar experience when I went to see my parents at work. And um, yeah, they were just, they were electrical engineers, and I just saw them on a computer drawing lines. And uh, I decided I don't want to do electrical engineering <laughs> at all. But um, when I was little, I was actually totally obsessed with space. Like I, I actually wanted to be an astronaut. And actually, some people at my work had a similar experience. I think we were, uh, I think I was just really into science. Um, I think just really, when I was a kid, I thought it was crazy that we sent a person, many people, up to the moon. And I just remember I was just watching, like, you know, rather than cartoons, I just watched these Apollo tapes that my mom gave me of <laughs> people walking around on the moon. And I thought that was, like, the most amazing thing ever. And um, I was just always really, you know, into aerospace, like, flight, airplanes. And when I got to high school, I um, was applying to colleges, and I got into Berkeley. Berkeley doesn't offer aerospace engineering, yeah. so I just did mechanical, um, thinking that I could get into that if I wanted to. And um, I think with mechanical engineering, it was a, kind of a similar thing. Like, there's so much you can do. And uh, I think I just really enjoyed, like, learning. It was kind of, I just wanted to invent new things and build new things. And I think um, what I got out of college was just tools that I could use in the future. Um, so yeah, that's, I think that's kind of where we are. It's not a straightforward path. I think the main yeah. thing is just, like, Find out what you really want to do, and I think just focus on that, and um, you'll, I think you'll be fine. Yeah. Okay. So we um, talk a lot about you know not just the, the history of computers, but where things are going in, in the future. We know everything is you know, changing very quickly, and things are going to keep happening and, and, and being different. And so um, we all, as you know, in our in our career paths, there's always you know you guys talked about the paths you are and your where you are now, but I'm sure that. You there's things that you guys want to learn or, or um, challenge yourselves to do in the future. Is there anything that you know you want to share with us about? You know, in the next five to ten years, what do you see yourself doing, or what are what are things that you hope to areas in which you hope to develop or learn new skills? I could I could probably take take that one for now. And, um, it's interesting how things are moving so quickly with technology, and how technology is really helping solve problems that are really. Um, happening. I mean, things that are really, really happening. So have you guys heard of the term social entrepreneurship? Have anybody? So, so that's something that we could talk about later. So social entrepreneurship is, is really, uh, let's say you start a business, but you're solving a problem in, the, in society. Right? So it has like a double bottom line return. It has a financial return and a social return. 
So for instance, you find an issue, let's say, with you know, kids that are not learning, just to give an example. You know, what can we do to solve that issue? Is there an app that we could utilize to facilitate that learning? Uh, and as you said earlier, how, how marrying technology with a solution is, is such a thing that is happening. It's so hard right now, right? A lot of uh, companies are starting just thinking about the problem first, and then how can they solve it through technology? Uh, so if you guys are thinking about career paths and everything, think about things that you would like to solve in the world, and don't think that they are too crazy. Just think, and if you desire them, I bet you you will find a company that is already trying to do something about it, or maybe a startup company that you could join that maybe they're trying to do something about it. Just, just think crazy, and, and whatever you want to do to help the world, I think that's a good start for you. Whatever you're, you feel right here, right? Like, what can I do to, to, to help the environment, to help the ocean, to help uh, you know, the elderly, you know, to help other kids like myself, and things like that. So definitely, definitely, that marriage is, is very important. I think the, I would say the exact same thing. I think uh, we've, you know, for me, I've done, like, kind of got started doing, um, my startup was basically that. It was a, you know, social, kind of social venture. I think, um, just want to kind of reiterate that it wasn't, it's not about uh, developing a technology, it's about uh, fixing a problem. And I think if you can think about that, you know, and just see what's out there that you could use, that's, you know, you can do some really powerful things. And so 10 years from now, I think for me, uh, you mentioned elderly. So, I mean, we're working on things for kids and people with disabilities, but I think um, aging is going to be a huge issue. We're, probably in 10 years, there's going to be twice as many people as there are now over 65 years old, and we don't have the ability to take care of them. So uh, right now, things are okay, but in 10 years, we're going to be kind of scrambling. So I think that's something really we're going to be working on. That's great. Yeah, to hop on that, um, I think with today's political climate, I've always been intrigued um, at how far behind technology is in like government solutions and political sectors. Like, um, if you think about just like the immigration process or the citizen process, process, it requires like like many documents going into like separate agencies, like a lot of like similar repetitive work. And you think about like hey, like, why don't we just have one solution that's like online, right? Like, you don't have to type your name, your passport number, whatever, like multiple times. Why is, why is, why is our government so far behind um, compared to the solutions that are coming out of, um, coming out of Silicon Valley or everywhere? Um, so I think to follow on like the social entrepreneurship, I definitely want to be working on something that makes impact um, but is solving um, a major problem. I think a lot of what we do nowadays in Silicon Valley like, that's coming out is really cool, fascinating things, but there's a lot of basic problems that we haven't solved yet, or we have the solutions for, but we just haven't applied them yet. So I think it's important to go back and say, hey, like, how do we solve these simple problems um, like, while focusing on something like making Snapchat filters or something more like you know, higher end uh, consumers to use. Hmm. Um, I'm really excited about the role that space technology is going to play in the future. Um, satellites help us learn so much more about our own planet, but they also provide the opportunity to monitor things like the fires that are devastating us not very far away from here. or. Puerto Rico or Houston or Florida monitor hurricanes and the damage that's being caused and information that you can only learn by viewing it from orbit. Um, so I think satellite technology is going to continue to provide us really important services and things are getting smaller, cheaper, faster, lighter. And the technology that you have in your, on your smartphone, the processing power on your smartphone is more than they had on board Apollo when we landed on the moon. I mean, that's incredible. We all, we all have that just in our pocket. So it's this crazy exponential curve of what's possible. And if you can imagine it, then you can engineer it. And there's really just no limit to the amazing things that are going to happen, I'm sure. And then it's so exciting to look out and how can we study our solar system and learn more about 
the planets and moons in our own solar system in ways that are completely different than we've done before. So when we go to Saturn, or we go to Jupiter, or we go to the moons, we've sent one big spacecraft. What if we could send 100? What if we could send 1,000? Because now they're, they can be this small, not the size of a school bus, you know? It's just, it's changing so rapidly. And there's so much room for creativity and imagination. And what do you want to learn? What, what service do you want to provide? What do you want to study? It's just wide open. It's so exciting. So I'm really excited about that. Awesome. All right, I have one more question for you guys before I'm going to open it up to the room for questions. So just so you guys know, you got a couple more minutes, but start thinking about your questions. Um, but so I'm really interested to hear about the sorts of the, the trends and the, the directions that you think you know people are going to be focusing their attentions on the sorts of problems that um, technology will, will hopefully help us address in the future. I'm curious to know if there is you know one thing or a particular technology trend or something that you either see or you read about. We all read about you know the different trends in technology and what's coming out. But something that you think in the next couple of years is really going to be a game changer or um, explode. You know, really change the way that we're we're looking at technology. Um, I this is like uh, two things. Be totally your opinion. That's yeah, two things <laughs> I think of. Um, I think uh, what Oscar was talking about, like a lot of like the tangible things um, in the last ten years, were like, oh, we're no like we're no longer having bookstores. We're no longer having like simple things. Everything is going digital. And now I feel like um, in the upcoming years, it's like we're bringing back these things, but we're putting software into them, right? Like that's sort of like the Internet of Things idea, but like I, the idea of like Beauty and the Beast comes to mind, where like you know all these like teapots and <laughs> clocks and this are like they're no longer stationary, but they like they have um, understanding and thoughts and processes um, that kind of connect them together. And I feel like um, we were thinking about tangible things separately and then software separately. And in the f very near future, we're going to see a lot more of those being um, combined together um, to make a, a different experience come to life. Yeah, that's, that's definitely, definitely exciting. Uh, me particularly, I'm very excited about the, uh, the digital technology that is coming up. And there is this, this guy, he's like 27, 30 years old, very young guy. And uh, he's developing this technology that is completely digital and he's using your body to actually display the technology. So for instance, you know, instead of you having your cell phone physically, your cell phone will be displayed on, your, on the palm of your hand. And you can actually dial the number in the palm of your hand. Of course, you have to have like a little device, so it's fascinating. He could also use any wall to create a computer screen and just with the fingers. So he creates a computer screen and it's projected. He could use the, the wall just to you know, use a computer. So all that technology is coming so quickly and it's, and it's really happening. There's no, it's no science fiction anymore. And as you said, you know, your imagination is, is, is just limitless in what you could do. You said something very important that you, you, you could think in, then you could engineer it. So don't, don't, be, uh, don't put yourself limits in what you could think and what you could engineer to, to make it happen. It's just so much going on. So I'm very excited about the digital part of it and how we marry the digital part with, with the physical. And uh, so it's an exciting trend right now, I think. Were you asking how, like, what should, you know, the students here kind of think about in terms of, like, what to study thinking, or? No, I was in oh. terms of technology. I mean, you can What's going to happen? That. Yeah, what do you think is going to change? I mean, practice? so we have, we just had a baby this year and uh, I'm like almost certain he's not going to need a driver's license. Like he's not going to need to drive, learn to drive a car. I think that's just going to happen. Um, I think that, uh, and I mean robotics will be like a lot more prevalent. We'll probably have things that are um, doing, unfortunately, fortunately, like doing things that may be like a lot of repetitive, like manual work that people are doing right now will be taken over by machines. Um, I think that's that's also going to be happening. Um, so for for like you guys, I think really um, the person, the role of like the engineer is going to change as well. I think it's always been changing where things, we're just kind of, technology is going to be used as tools. So for example, like there used to be people, humans called computers that would just add numbers up. And there's, I don't even know, there's like probably tens of thousands of people employed in the US 
but once computers came, um, all those people were replaced by actual computers. But then that opened up so many more jobs for computer engineers and computer scientists, like way more than computers replaced. So I think uh, the main thing is just learn to use technology as a tool, but always kind of move up one level above. Like you can use, keep, I mean, as we talked about, like think about the problems you want to solve and how you can use technology as a tool. And I don't think people generally should be afraid of being replaced by um, robots or technology or things like that. I think it's more about just um, making your life easier and making your ability to solve problems easier. Um, I, I don't know if you know, but there are people living uh, hundreds of miles up on the International Space Station. It's been continuously manned, men and women, for years. And I'm really excited about taking that next step and sending people out into space to explore um, our solar system in person. And there's so much feedback on um, technology that's developed to keep people healthy and safe in space benefits people on Earth. Um, there's been so much that's been learned about medicine, the health of your skeletal system, the health of your cardiac system, the health of your nervous system, that um, has been because people are basically guinea, guinea pigs in space. While they're up there, there's so many experiments that take place. They give their blood, they give their urine, they take tissue samples, the whole thing. And that feedback is... Uh, for benefiting everyone is so exciting. And um, we're just really learning so much so fast and taking that next step. And as, as people, our innate sense of wanting to explore, um, I think is going to push us out into the solar system, certainly within your lifetime. So that's really exciting. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I just want to follow up on like what you might think about like studying or doing. Um, to describe my team to you, like there's a bunch of engineers, obviously, but we also have designers. We have UX user experience people on the team. We have marketing people, people who write really well. So it's like a, a people who are really good leaders or like know how to do, like program managers, like know how to run um, and like deliver a product. And that's something I didn't know until I got to Google. So that's like three years ago. Um, and that's something I would have liked to know all like in high school to know like hey I could I always thought hey you would have to be like an amazing engineer and that's the only type of person that works at Google but that's so not the, the right thing uh, this is so not true um, so if you do like design like you can still like integrate and mer like do that in technology or um, if you like talking to people like that there, there's still a space for you like when we build a pro products. There's a lot of engineering that goes into it. There's a lot of design. There's a lot of marketing um, that goes into it. So you can use all different types of skills, and we need all different types of people, backgrounds, um, to come together to deliver a product that the entire world can use, not just a certain one type of person, because then only certain type of people can use that product. So I'm going to echo that so strongly because there's no, you don't become something that fits in a nice little box and you need to think, okay, I'm going to grow up and this is going to be who I am as a professional. It takes artists, scientists, engineers, programmers, people with a little, you know, you can, you can broadly be interested in a lot of things and how unique is that to bring, you know, everything that you're interested in and you're passionate about that makes you unique, you're so valuable to you know, companies, NASA, it's, it's really changing. It's, you don't have this title of, okay, you're a mechanical engineer and all you care about is mechanical engineer topic. No, like, can you illustrate? Can you draw? Can you explain your ideas? If you can't communicate your ideas, where are they gonna go? Um, it really is so multidisciplinary and people you get on the job and you might understand some of it, but there might be this aspect of the job that you aren't maybe trained for, you've never heard of. The world is at your fingertips. You can learn, you can take classes, your skill set can become so diverse and truly what you are passionate about um, is so valuable, so. Yeah, yeah I, I definitely agree with you guys. It's, it's, it's been, uh, you know, I took my nephew Mateo to Apple for the first time because I, I, I was encouraging him to go into technology. And uh, when we walk into Apple and I show him the building and everything, he, he thought, he said, oh, I thought this was going to be different. I said, what, what do you mean? I thought it was going to be a building full of computers and servers and everybody's, you know, 
And, and no, it, it wasn't that. You know, I, you know, there are so many people from everywhere, from different levels of skills. And so each of you has a talent, right? There is a job opening for that talent. Whatever skills you have, whether in writing, in design, in engineering, in, in, in motivation, in motivational speakers. I mean, we need psychologists also in the, in the tech industry. So it's so diverse, and we need people from all backgrounds, uh, both ethnically and professionally. Ethnically, because we are global now. Everything has no limits anymore. Technology has done that. It has expanded our reach to the world. It's not only our city anymore. It's not only our community. It's the states. It's another country. It's another continent. So the reach is global. So we need people to speak many languages, or two languages, or, or one language, or whatever. But we need every, everyone. So that is the points that you guys brought up is so important because that will open up you guys' eyes to the different fields in technology. Uh, anything you could do. You know, I'm, a, I'm a process guy. I'm not a developer. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a programmer. So I'm, I, I really don't program or anything. I'm a process guy. So I see the process more strategic on how we want to take one thing to the other, but I work in technology. So just to give you guys sort of an idea. So that's so important. I want to um, step in and just make sure you guys have a chance to, to ask your questions. Um, so I'm going to open up the floor now. Um, Alex has the microphone, so if you have a question that you would like to ask, um, if you raise your hand, he can bring that around. If you wrote down a question, um, or if you want to write down a question, um, the rest of the team can help collect those. So if you have something that you've written down, um, please just hold it up so they know they can come around and collect them, and they'll bring them up to me. Um, and does anyone have a question they want to ask? with the mic to start with. All right. <laughs> Do you want to ask a question, Mark? Uh, my question is, what were you most afraid of when you started your current job? That's a good question. <laughs> Have you all ever heard of imposter syndrome? I was just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's this feeling like, you aren't, like they're going to find out that you're really not as good as they think you are, or you're really not supposed to be here, or you don't see people that look like you, or talk like you, or whatever, and so you, you think you're really not supposed to be here, and you get freaked out, like you, you, you just, your self-confidence goes away. And when you enter a field with so many brilliant people from all over the world with degrees from all these amazing institutions, it can be so easy to feel like, oh my gosh, any minute now someone's going to walk in the door and tell me they made a mistake and I'm not really supposed to be here and it's, and nobody talks about it. But uh, it's real. <laughs> I think most people experience it and you just got to look back on everything you've accomplished up to today. How much have you accomplished? And if you're on the path that you believe in and you're doing what you want to do, then you just got to brush that off. And, yeah. That's true. Yeah, that, that's definitely true. I think uh, any job is really scary, right? You walk into a job situation and you're brand new, you're the new guy, the new girl, and, and there's a lot of things that you need to learn and everything. But, you know, but it, it really comes down to your, to your desire to move ahead in, in your common sense. Because believe it or not, guys, even though we go to school, we learn everything, you know, the school really teaches you how to think. And when you go to the workplace, you know, that's when you apply your creative thinking, right? So it is, it, is, it, is, it is kind of scary just to go to a new job and everything, but there are a lot of things that you learn while doing the job. The things that they won't teach you in school, but you have to actually do the job. So, you know, go out there, you know, take the chance, take the risk. If you're feeling afraid, that's a good sign. That means that you want to learn something new. Um, so take, take the chance. But, you know, I'm, I'm with you. You know, we are with you. We, are, we were afraid at uh, one point or the other, right? So. Uh, I just want to quickly say, so I think it's also, like, how well you handle failure. I, like, I wasn't good at it. I'm still, like, learning how to do that real well, like, for example, yesterday, um, someone on my team, a guy, um, he had submitted some code and it was like a really weird bug, but essentially the VP of photos was like, my photos isn't working. And so like, 
you had like all these really important people like assigned to this bug, like their like accounts weren't working and like everyone else's was working. And it turns out it was a bug that he had submitted. And he just like laughed it off, fixed it real fast, and then like it's gonna be fixed today. And I just like admired him so much and to say like he was able to laugh it off, be like, oh, that was a stupid mistake, like I'll I'll learn for next time. And I'm just thinking, like, if I was in his position, I'd be like anxiety ridden and just be like, I messed it up, and like the VP like is gonna hate me now. Like I introduced this bug, but it's just like how well do you handle failure and how like well do you move forward? Because there's like so many points of failure, but it's just like how do you learn and how do you ma not make that happen again um, is a really big thing. Yeah, I think that's very important. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was most afraid of, I guess when we were on our own, um, I was most afraid of like nobody buying our product. We'd run out of money. Our investors would take all the money back and I'd have to lay off everybody, which would have been terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but I think just the important thing is not to think about that. Uh, or not to like dwell on that because um, that's just not like productive. And I think dwell like you on said, the worst case scenario. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think um, yeah. Also, just yeah. There's so many times when things are not going to go right, and I think it's just really important to also not dwell on that. Like learn the mistake, um, but just move on. I think uh, learn. I think they say like you don't have to always, you know, get the correct answer. I think it's about like how hard you work and how, what you learn along the way, that makes you much more successful long run. All right, so I have two questions here that are sort of opposite sides of the, the same questions. We'll ask them both together and you guys can answer them as you wish. The um, person wants to know what, uh, what it is, what's something that you don't like about your job? Like that, you know, and then someone else asks, what's the most exciting aspect of your job? So I'm gonna share one or both of those things. Go, go for it. Go. Okay, I think the <laughs> most, I'll start with the most exciting thing. Um, I think for us, like, we basically get to do it. I mean, I get to do whatever I want within, I mean, obviously within reason, but as long as we're, you know, I like to invent things, I like to help people. I think we, I mean, we're creating value that way. Um, no one's really telling me how to do that, which is like amazing to be able to be in that situation. Um, some of the most frustrating things, I think, um, sometimes things can be slow. I think I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I could talk about the most frustrating thing would also be like, I joined Google Photos, I work on the Android side, and there's just like a lot of things in Android just like are really slow, like the builds and this and that. Um, so you're like constantly having to like work through like, a lot of churn um, when um, that's a little frustrating. Um, and like everything's always changing, like technologies, and you're always like, ah, I don't, like, am I on it? Am I on it? Um, so I constantly like, have that fear of like not being on, like um, learning like the newest thing because there's so much to learn. But eventually you're like, okay, I'll just, I'll take it as it comes. Uh, one of the greatest things is um, I really, really like the people. Like, I obviously love the product that I work on, but I really enjoy the people I work with, and I think that's a big thing, and people don't talk about, like, hey, like, you're gonna join a job. Like, these are the people you're probably gonna be hanging out with most in your life, because you go home, and then you'll see your friends on the weekends, but these people, you're, like, eight plus hours a day. Like, I sit with the same people, um, and if you don't, like, enjoy hanging out with them or bouncing ideas or just talking, like, random stuff, um, you're having lunch with them, um, it makes life pretty miserable. So I got pretty lucky in having a great team. That's awesome. Um, for me, it would be the, uh, the technical writing part. Um, I, I love writing, don't take me wrong, I love creative writing. But when it comes down to technical writing, it's like, ah, it's just, it's kind of, for me, it's kind of boring. So I try not to do it, I try to delegate it. Like, oh, can you please help me with this? And so technical writing is, is very much part of what we do at Genin Tech because we are very regulated by the FDA, by, you know, by law and everything. So we have to make sure that every document speaks the truth and it follows a process and is documented well, not only in paper, but digitally as well, and where it's a store. So because there is a lot of uh, liability, we have to be very, very careful with that, with that documentation. So that's the least part that I like, the, the technical writing part. What I love about my job, one of the things that I love is, it gets me excited, is like I, I travel, I travel with work. 
Um, on Sunday, I'm leaving to Spain, to the office in Spain, in Madrid. And I speak Spanish, so that will be helpful when I get to the office there. And that's what I love, you know, they send me to Ireland, or to London, or to Spain, or to Switzerland. So that, that's fun, because I get to eat different food. <laughs> <laughs> so that's fun. And I do it, you know, different people, different cultures and different languages. So, um, so it's exciting. That's the exciting part that I like. Okay. Um, most frustrating thing I like the least is, so I work for the government, you know, mm -hmm. uh, NASA is a federal agency. So as a civil servant, it's not, we don't have catered lunches, you know, we don't have lavish lifestyles at work. It's pretty, our budget it's pretty limited. We have to do as much as we can with the budget that we have, which sometimes can be frustrating if things get canceled or you pour your heart and soul into something and then it maybe doesn't work out or we have an administration change and the administration changes what our priorities are, things like that. Um, but I don't know where else in the country I would be sitting at my desk one minute and designing a trajectory to get to Mars and then in the next minute be studying how we can be captured into an orbit around the moon for this upcoming mission that's going to be launched. I mean, you've got to pinch yourself sometimes. Some of the stuff that we get to do is, where else would I be able to do this? It's, it's really so inspiring to be able to work with the people that I work with and do the things that we do. So the good outweighs the frustrating part a <laughs> hundred times over. So. So Tracy might not have an answer to this question, but a couple of people want to know if you weren't doing what you're doing now, it seems like you're, you know, your job pretty much love it. If you weren't doing what you're doing now, if you didn't go into technology, or you didn't do in, go into this field, what would you, what do you, where would you see yourself? Where do you think you would be? Uh, I could talk about it. I still like to keep up with my design hobbies, so I actually like run a stationery company with uh, two of my friends. Uh, I don't really get to spend a lot of time with it, but I imagine in this fantastical world. Uh, other world, uh, I'd be doing something with design um, and entrepreneurship. Cool. I, I would say that um, if I weren't in technology, I would own a bakery. Mm. <laughs> yes. I love it. I love bread. I like bread. <laughs> so I would be baking bread. Carbs. I would put yes. Cherry carbs. <laughs> Can I work with you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So that's what I will do. Maybe one day, I don't know, when I retire, maybe I could open my bakery. <laughs> maybe right in the corner over here. <laughs> yeah? Uh, I would like to stay in research in some capacity. I love finding out new things, doing research, pushing, pushing boundaries. So, yeah. Um, probably the same. I might be a professor. Mm. Cool. Or an astronaut. Or an astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to ask uh, one more question, um, and then um, obviously you guys will have a chance to talk to them all later um, if you get a chance. But um, these are also two sort of um, related questions. Is someone was asking um, how long you've been at your current job, like how long it, how long you've been there, and how long it, it took you to, to get used to it and feel really comfortable. Um, but also specifically what, and we talked a little bit about this, but if you can elaborate a little bit on the specific your specific qualifications, like degrees and and what you how you got there. Okay, I can. Just all right, so I guess we've been at Google for three years, and then um, prior to that, I had my company for about three years. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, qualifications, so um, I just have a bachelor's, master's, and PhD in mechanical engineering. There, like, but I think once I got to grad school, we started to learn a lot more from other fields. So it was kind of like a mix between mechanical and material science and some electrical. Um, what was the other question? Or is that it? OK. Uh, yeah, so I have a bachelor's in computer science. I went to school at Berkeley, graduated in three and a half years, and then um, have been at Google for three years. And Google, essentially, like, quick rundown, like, for a software engineering position, you basically had to go through, like, technical interview rounds where you show them that you can code and think through solutions. Um, and yeah, that was the, those were the interview process. So I didn't really care if you majored in computer science or if you majored in Latin, like if you can code and can um, explain your solutions, like that's what we're looking for. Cool, cool. So I, I'm with, uh, all together with Genentech four years, but they were in two separate locations. Um, let's see about, 
six years ago, I moved to the East Coast because um, I went to Georgetown University where I got my MBA. And when I was there, towards graduation, I was recruited by IBM. So I ended up staying three more years in the East Coast. Um, then I was recruited by Apple back in Cupertino. So I figured, okay, this is my chance to come back to the Bay Area. So I started working with Apple. Uh, but then I wasn't too excited about Apple. I, you know, I, was, I felt like I was a little part of the machine. So I was like, eh, I don't like this. So I went back to Genentech. So altogether four years uh, working for Genentech. <laughs> Um, so I've been at NASA Ames since January, like I said. Um, it didn't take long to get comfortable. I kind of hit the ground running. Um, you just got to dive in, you know. Um, before that, I was uh, in grad school. I did, got a PhD in aerospace engineering at the University of Texas. Before that, there was a six and a half year time where I was working at Johnson Space Center in a different research lab between getting my bachelor's degree and PhD. And PhD was something I never thought in a million years I would do. Um, but I kind of felt like I worked for a while after having that bachelor's, and I kind of sensed this sort of ceiling on the opportunities that I wanted to do and realizing that I didn't quite have the chops to get to do that type of research work. The bachelor's degree is such an awesome foundation for whatever field you want to pursue. Um, but in my case, it wasn't quite enough to allow you to it just wasn't quite deep enough to do research type work. So I um, found actually a NASA fellowship uh, that funded my PhD. I didn't have to pay for it, which is a fantastic opportunity. Um, I also did community college as part of my bachelor's program. And if you think you might go the route of community college, um, there's a really cool NASA program for community college students that if you wanted to talk more about that or learn more about that, I'd be happy to tell you about it. There's, there's so many opportunities for furthering your education that are out there. Um, so I encourage you to, to, to see that in your future. See that for yourself. Don't sell yourself short. I think I did. I think, I think again, that imposter syndrome, you don't see yourself pursuing these higher degrees or you don't see yourself. I maybe didn't see myself working at NASA, but you just got to believe in yourself and go for it and follow your passion. So. Thank you guys. So we are going to wrap up in just a second and I'm going to let the panelists um, get off the stage and, and to their next station. But before I do that, the next thing we're going to do is allow you guys are going to have a chance to go check in with each of them individually, ask the questions that maybe we didn't get to ask up here. Um, and I just would like each of you to tell us very quickly what it is that you brought with you today to share during the showcase so that uh, the students know a little bit about what they can expect <laughs> as they wander around the room. Okay, um, we brought uh, one of our latest devices, and there's a video kind of showing how it works, but um, you should just go come by and you can play with it. Yeah. Um, I'll have some videos running about some cool photos features that we're building on Android, uh, but I also brought um, two VR devices, and uh, you'll be able to take a look at some VR photos. So I brought you a map of the location of Genentech and where we are located and the numbers of employees working there. But I also have a video about DNA research and uh, how our DNA plays such an important part in who we are and how Genentech is uh, developing drugs to, to, to make us healthier, pretty much. Cool. Um, I brought two small satellites. I want you to pick them up, touch them, look at them. Um, they're not scale models. They're the actual engineering units. Um, I have some fact sheets, I have some posters, I have some stickers, um, and then I have a poster just to tell you a little bit more about what my group does at Ames. All right, thank you guys so much. Give our